this uh, lecture mostly focuses on the four years that you're here at Kings County and Downstate. Um, maybe some of it you could take uh, into your future. I'm hoping to take some of it into my future, but this is sort of my way of passing on what I've figured out over the past four years here. And hopefully you guys can take something out of this. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about the art of the DOMA and how to survive residency. Um, so what is the DOMA? I think most of you guys are familiar, but in case anyone is watching this who isn't in emergency medicine, maybe my parents will watch this lecture one day. A DOMA stands for a day off my ass. Um, of note, there's two versions of it, um, and the comma really, really makes a difference. And I'm gonna demonstrate right now. So a DOMA without a comma can look something like this. Maybe a beach day, maybe a day hiking in the woods with your class, in the mountains, almost dying, hanging out with the best dog ever, on a chairlift somewhere where it's sunny and nice, soaking it all in in a hot tub, or really just starting your morning off right. But definitely a day outside of the emergency department, really enjoying your 24 hours off and making the most of it. Because by ACGME standards, when you're off from 7 p.m. that one night until 7 p.m. that next night, that is a day off. In contrast, a DOMA with a comma looks something like this. And I just have to throw my ex-roommate under the bus a little bit. Um, but uh, this is uh, what I often see, saw Paul doing on his DOMAs. Um, <laughs> Not exclusively limited to Paul, the EMIMs are also susceptible to this. Um, but that's kind of what a DOMA with a comma looks like. Um, and it's really not a day off your ass. It's like a day completely on your ass. Um, and you really just need that full 24 hours to recover from everything else um, that you're doing in residency. So why do we have DOMAs with commas? Um, we worked, at least when I was a junior, we worked 12 hour shifts that often turned into 14 hour shifts. I think you guys still work 12s at Lutheran. Um, and especially with the commute, those can be really long shifts. Um, we stay late after shift finishing notes or we come in before shift to finish all our notes. Um, we have cumulative sleep debt when we're working six, seven days in a row and after shift, you have to come home, you gotta do all of your other life stuff. Um, we get compassion fatigue, we're sick and tired of people not believing in COVID, people asking us for sandwiches when we don't have enough sandwiches, people wanting the only medication that starts with a D. We deal with microaggressions at work, despite giant badges that scream doctor, everyone calls us nurse. We have to throw in the lines that the nurses haven't even looked for. We have to send the <laughs> urine that no one has even tried to get. We're voluntold to make presentations that on topics that we don't even really want to do. We have to lead journal clubs and morning reports. Now we have to come to conferences every time in person. <laughs> every day we get emails from new innovations that we have to log our duty hours, fill out evals, complete advancement tasks. Um, and we work in a broken healthcare system. So this is a lot of stuff that we have to deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes you just wanna spend those 24 hours totally like sleeping it off, it off and not caring about the world. Um, so this is just a compilation of screenshots of our broken healthcare system um, from over the years of all this stuff that you don't really learn how to deal with in medical school 
and you kind of have to learn how to deal with in residency. And sometimes people just don't really, don't really know how to guide you. Um, and sometimes that's also why you have a DOMA because you just, you just can't deal, right? And then this is also what we have to deal with at work on a day-to-day -day basis. And not everything always works, right? Sometimes you just really don't know what to do. Sometimes you can never reach radiology. Um, sometimes you gotta be really innovative with how you get access um, and how you feed yourself on shift. And sometimes <laughs> shit just happens, excuse my language, um, and nothing ever works. So a lot of times residency kind of feels like this. You're trying to like climb a mountain where you're totally unprepared or you're about to go on a hike in the snow in some sandals. And how do you go from this to feeling like this? A lot of it, I think, can be changed in how we approach DOMAs. Um, so this is totally my perspective, but this is what I think DOMAs are for. I think you definitely gotta cover your basics. You have to shower all that COVID, vomit, sweat, the smell of alcohol and diabetes off of you when you get home from work. You definitely have to eat and sleep. Otherwise you're gonna be hangry, sleep deprived, mad, whatnot. You should probably wash your scrubs, if not the rest of your laundry. Um, and then if you have other people that you need to take care of, your pets, your kids, and your significant others, you gotta give them the attention that they deserve. That's the basics. That's like the core of your DOMA, but that doesn't take 24 hours. Um, so I would argue the next thing DOMAs are for are for the plans, whether that's a climbing trip to the gunks, um, whether that's having brunch or going to a journal club, whether that's like a concert or show or something more local in Brooklyn or the New York area, prioritize those plans and stick to those plans because you're always gonna find time for everything else. When you gotta work out, you gotta go grocery shopping and meal prep. Eventually you'll clean the parts of the apartment that you really need to be clean. Um, and maybe you'll call your mom and dad. Um, so how do you get all this done? How do you have the time to really spend your 24 hours on your DOMA um, and not end up on your ass all day? A lot of people think ER docs are really good at multitasking, but I think, especially if you've read any of the sort of multitasking literature in the past decade or so, it's not really multitasking that people get good at. It's switch tasking that people get good at. Um, this is not a lecture on how to be a good switch tasker um, that you'll develop over time. Um, but some of the tips that I have on how to really make the most out of your time on shift and at work and with all of the things that you have to do in residency are as follows. So when you're on shift, and I know you guys have had a separate lecture on general productivity, I say use your downtime to do all that extra new innovations crap that you have to do before you log on to Instagram or Facebook or go to the deli for the fourth time or go on social rounds, just do all that new innovation stuff. When you get that bolus of 150 evaluations for every attending that exists in the like county system, just like pick one overnight speed shift and do it all. Um, before you dispo, very specifically like discharge, especially your patient, just like write the note. If your patient is okay to go home, unless it's someone that you're calling 4,300 to get out to go home, they can probably wait another minute or two for you to finish your note before you hand them their discharge papers. Um, admitted patients, 
it's a little bit different, but try to get your note done as close as possible because the emitting team or the consulting team also wants to know what the heck is going on with this patient. That's gonna help you get your notes done before shift is over a lot faster. Um, use a checklist for every patient. Everyone has their own system. I personally like the Epic comments section. They also have a comment section in HealthBridge and that's sort of my internal checklist. I'm sure you guys have seen Dr. Wiener's checklist, Dr. Salway's checklist. Everyone has their own system, but create a system and use it so that every time you think about a patient, you don't have to rethink them from the beginning. You can just refer to your checklist of things that you need to get done for that patient as you get them to their final destination. Um, send the urine yourself, especially in the system that we work in. It's worth your time to walk the patient to the bathroom and hand them the cup and print out the label and send the urine yourself because otherwise it's a three or four hour thing where you're trying to figure out, did the nurse take it? Is it in the POC lab? Do you have to call the lab? Make sure that they're running the, the sample urine to calibrate the machine for the fifth hour in a row um, or if it's lost. So just send it yourself. Um, and then make calls while writing notes or essentially when you're sitting down. How many times have I seen residents, and I've also done this myself, I'm like, oh, I gotta call this consultant. So I run to the desk and I call the operator and I say, page this person. And then 30 seconds later, I'm like seeing another patient or I'm dealing with somebody else. And then when that consultant calls back, I'm not there. And even though it's like paged overhead and my attending hears it, they're not picking it up. So then you're spending the next three hours trying to get that consultant again and they're super pissed because you keep paging them. So batch, batch your calls, like see your patients, sit down, start writing your notes, page all your consultants, call the lab to find that urine that hasn't been run yet to follow up on how much longer is that troponin gonna be, to be on hold with CT scan for the next three minutes because nobody's picking up before you push your patients there. Batch that all while you're sitting down near the phone so that when you need to answer the phone for the people that you've paged, you're there. Um, Dr. Sinner always says more patients equals more learning, which is true, but don't pick up 17 hallway if you have a complicated patient that you just need a minute to look up more on. It's gonna be better for your education and for your flow to look up what to do for that complicated patient than to pick up that complicated patient and go to C17 hallway and then have no idea what to do. And then you have to spend more time trying to like back look up what to do as they start crashing. Um, and then lastly, go home at the end of your shift. And when I mean at the end of your shift, I mean at the end of your shift after you've signed out and maybe done like your last one or two notes, not two hours after your shift. So that's, that's my advice. Um, and then how to have a life in residency. It's hard. This advice applies purely to this residency. Um, make plans for your domas and stick to them. Then you'll actually feel like you actually had more days off and enjoyed more time. You have what, in like 28 days, the juniors are working like 21 shifts, the seniors are working 18, 19. That's like eight or nine days. Some of those are going to be domas. Make plans for your domas so you actually feel like you did something. Um, you're gonna feel a lot more well, at least that's how I feel. This is kind of a unique thing um, at County. You get your three no questions asked requests off on your ED blocks. If you're fortunate enough to have back-to-back -back ED blocks, your last three of the first and your first three of the second, if you have no other requests, that's six days right there. You can go somewhere, do something with six days. That's a six day vacation. If you're lucky enough to have a two week vacation block in between, that's a 20 day vacation. You can do a lot in 20 days. It's almost like a whole elective. 
Um, take step three your intern year soon after or close to taking the in-service so that you can study for both at the same time. Don't drag it on until second year because you're going to spend so much time outside of everything that you have to do as a busy first and second year preparing for step three. Um, OBS and PEED shifts, especially on the nights, are great for getting work done, like making this senior lecture. Um, but also for like doing all your new innovation stuff. I think when you become a senior, the daytime op shifts can be kind of rough, but those overnight op shifts are kind of a blessing. The attendings know this too. Um, and then your PEDS shifts. I think everyone knows PEDS is always stacked with like five residents and especially on nights, use those nights to be productive. Um, stay out of board review. That's an extra hour every week that you could otherwise have for yourself, that you could be eating a really good lunch before your shift instead of like shoving some Popeyes down before you show up to like a terrible Wednesday afternoon um, shift because nothing has happened in the time where we're in conference. Um, and then use your elective time well. Um, I think everyone can identify that our program is great, but our program also has weaknesses. Um, and use your elective time to sort of build your skills and stuff that you feel that you're not getting great training in, um, in county, cough, ortho, cough. Um, and maybe explore new places or different practice environments. A lot of people choose to work at like a more community or critical access or maybe even like international site, um, but just to expand your experience working in the field of emergency medicine, but outside of our little bubble of county and downstate. Um, and then this is sort of like a daily affirmations and reminder, um, especially when you're feeling like residency is really hard second guessing your choices, like, why did I do this? Why didn't I just get that like bachelor's degree, go work that tech job, go get my weekends off, make six figures, have three dogs, go on vacation all the time. Remember why you chose this. And this is what I kind of think about myself. Um, I get to start each shift with like a fresh perspective. I don't have like all these ongoing projects that I need to refresh or Slack groups that I need to like re-engage uh, with. I can just start each shift totally new, learn about the patients there. Um, each patient that I go talk to is there in the emergency department, presumably because they think they have some form of emergency. So try to treat them as if each patient were your family member. Put them in your, put yourself in like their position. Um, and what would you do for them if you were accompanying this person to the emergency department? Um, we like emergency medicine because we like resuscitation and dealing with sick people and doing cool procedures. Um, but a big part of our job, especially at county, is like educating the healthcare illiterate. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And I think we're in that unique position to really help people figure out, like learn about health you know, that they don't go to med medical school for. And you get to educate them at a basic, um, like from a basic point of view, and also it's like immediately ap applicable to them. I do like that, you know, we get to help people navigate the healthcare system because it's crazy out there and connects people with services because a lot of time that's why they're coming to us. Um, and then also we give like very strong cocktails of medications that tend to work quicker. And it's really gratifying. We get that instant gratification of seeing our patients turn around, making them feel better, sending them home, giving them what they need uh, to feel better. I think a lot of people think notes and documentation are kind of like a chore, um, which it can be. But I think it's also kind of cool we're in that unique position. We get to talk to these patients, we get to hear their stories, and then we get to document it, like sort of our version of it, obviously sprinkled in with your like MDM as it pertains. But, you know, not every chest pain patient is that same template chest pain patient. And I think, you know, we have the power to document exactly what happened and all the characteristics 
of what brought them to the emergency department. And I think that's pretty unique and special. Um, it's always nice to feel like you're moving the meat, you're cleaning up the board, you're helping out your other colleagues, whether they're working with you or they're coming on right after you. And you know, it's kind of nice to feel productive. Um, and then lastly, like we leave our work at work. You know, we go home, we're not on call unless you're a chief. Um, it's kind of nice, like you get to show up to work, you do your work, and then you go home and then you have the rest of your life. Um, so that's awesome. So these are sort of my strategies and advice for when you're feeling down, when you're feeling overwhelmed and burnt out, when you're feeling like residency might be too much to handle or like, how do I do everything? This is like sort of my version of like your, your regular affirmations of why you chose emergency medicine. All right, and then so for the last part of my presentation, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and just talk about how to learn from different attendings. This is something I struggled with definitely as a junior, when you're trying to learn clinical medicine, you think everything is like black and white and it's really frustrating when you have one plan for one attending and then you sign out to a next attending that has a different style. And then sometimes you're the one thrown under the bus for having like a more conservative plan or a different plan or whatnot. Um, and it can be like really frustrating from the perspective of a resident because you're like, well, like what's the right thing to do? Or like, how do I manage all these different things? Um, so this is just a little bit talking about different attending styles and like how I kind of approach going to a shift. I will say, I never look at QGenda. I never look at who I'm working with because there's nothing you can do about it. So what's the point of like developing whatever feeling you're gonna have? Uh, about the shift that you have coming up, just embrace who shows up that day. Um, so we'll start with the cowboys, um, the attendings that don't want you to really order anything, don't want you to really call anybody, want you to you know push your scope of practice and do more. Um, I think Kings County probably has a good number of these. Um, so how do you learn from a an attending like this? I think this really helps you think about emergency medicine and how broad your scope of practice can be. And also maybe what you wanna do or how you would approach a situation if you don't even have the availability of all your consultants and backup and additional testing. Um, and just focus on what you need at the core to take care of this patient and figure out what's going on and making them feel better and getting them to where they need to go. In contrast, our conservative attendings, uh, the ones who want to over order and over consult and make you talk to everyone and God forbid you have to call neuro and keep them in the emergency department for another six hours. Um, how do you learn from these attendings? I like to think about it as, you know, sometimes we don't have the greatest respect for some of our consultants, um, but they always have something to teach us they see things from a different perspective focused on their area of expertise. They might have a broader differential than you even have, even if it's not necessarily pertinent to like your emergency medicine differential. Um, and I think a lot of times we consult is because we don't have like great follow-up um, for a lot of our patients. And that's also something that probably factors into these decisions of like why we're consulting people that maybe we don't truly, maybe you don't think um, need to be consulted from the emergency department. And then there's also probably a lot of the medical legal considerations that maybe some of our attendings have. And I think that's op always open to like a conversation of like, why has something happened in the past? Is there something that I need to think about that I haven't experienced myself? Um, that I need to think about medically, medical legally, that's like making you uh, practice in this way. Um, we have our attendings that kind of focus more on the art of medicine, um, where you know it's not all about like science and numbers, but more about your gut feeling um, and what do you think or what do you feel is best for this patient. Um, I think you can learn a lot from these attendings, not only building up your um, gut feeling over the next 
four years as you train in emergency medicine, but also, you know, thinking about doing patient-centered practice. Um, yes, the science may say this, yes, the guidelines might say this, but like, what do you actually think you should do um, for this patient as the best way to help them here in the emergency department and get them out? So I think you can take a step back from all your like papers and numbers and whatnot, and just think about how can you treat this patient as like a person. Um, in contrast, we have our bookworms, our ones who are focused on all of the scientific studies. And I think what you can learn from these attendings is, you know, I haven't read every landmark study either on why we do things certain ways in the emergency department. But I think when you're working at these kinds of attendings, this is your opportunity to figure out what those studies are, either landmark studies, meta-analysis, versus just primary literature, those like new pilot studies that are coming out on different ways to treat things. And I think as you delve more into the literature, you'll realize there's a lot of stuff that we do that doesn't really have great evidence behind it um, and realize that there's a whole world out there for more scientific uh, research exploration and trying to figure out what, what is the right thing to do or what is the best studied thing to do and see if like that's maybe something that you wanna also pursue and contribute to in the future. Um, next we have our pimps, um, the ones that like to really grill you on every differential, um, every detail of um, a disease process. I think as you get a further and further away from being a med student, Sometimes you get a little frustrated with these attendings because you're like, I already know all this, um, but it's always good to have like a review. And I have found myself being like, oh yeah, I forgot about that differential or I forgot about that zebra um, that we need to think about. Um, so I think when you work with attendings like this, it's always nice to think about a broader differential to really look through all the disease processes and think about um, why each thing that you think about is important when it comes to each patient, especially once your patient gets like really complicated with multiple different like systems that you need to address. This is probably gonna be me in a couple of weeks, um, but I'm sure you guys have all had the attendings that are like, well, I don't know, what do you wanna do? Maybe we should like look this up together. And you guys are doctor Googling together on shift or wiki EMing together on shift. Um, and trying to figure it out. And I think it's humbling to work with people like this because you realize your attendings aren't these like gods that are omnipresent or like know everything essentially, um, but that people have to, you know, your attendings have to look stuff up too. And how many times have you worked with an attending and then gotten like a couple of papers emailed to you after shift about a patient that you had no idea what was going on or what to do for them in the emergency department? And then you finally had a couple hours after shift to like read about them. Um, so I think this is also an attending that you can take away a lot from and then realize that, you know, you're working together as a team and that you can figure it out together. Um, we have our uh, helicopter parent attendings, the ones that want to be intimately involved in everything. Um, they want to see the patients. They want to put in all the orders. They want to be breathing down your neck as you put in that central line. Um, and I think um, it can be really frustrating to work with these attendings too, especially as you become a senior, as you get more independent, especially the second year as you get all this like critical care um, training and time, you feel like you're finally a badass, you know how to do all these things. Um, and then you deal with an, an attending like this. But I think there's also a lot to learn from these attendings. Um, they might have like a different way or technique of doing that same procedure that you've done a million times. Maybe they pick up something else in their story or in their physical that you missed um, when you talked to the patient or when you saw the patient. Um, so don't dismiss these attendings. There's a lot to learn from them and they're only going to better improve um, your practice and your techniques for doing things. Um, we have our absentee parent attendings, the ones that are always across the street at the deli for their sixth trip, in the office, 
on an admin meeting call, sleeping in their car. Um, when you're working with these attendings, I think you can learn to develop a lot of independence. Um, you might be able to call that code stroke based off of your evaluation of this patient. You might be able to call that code heart based on your quick look at that EKG um, and really learning how to, you know, manage the room by yourself, manage critical patients by yourself, manage like new things that are happening all the time by yourself. I think when you're a junior, you can really rely on your seniors in this situation, but for the seniors, this is your opportunity to build a lot of independence. Um, we have our attendings who are super detail oriented um, and like to go the extra mile for the patients and maybe may not work at the fastest pace that you might uh, work at. Um, and I think a lot of times we feel like when we work with these attendings, we're never gonna leave shift on time, um, but it's okay. Um, I think these attendants also have a lot to teach us. Um, when we see our patients in the emergency department, it's probably because the rest of the healthcare system, the outpatient clinics, their primary care doctors, maybe are failing them. And then also realize if you need a disposition this patient into the hospital, you all know what the medicine floors look like. You don't know, you all know how neurology operates. Um, so maybe it is worth it to spend a little bit more time sitting on this patient in the emergency department, doing a little bit more for them and being a little bit more thorough with your chart review and with your workup just to help out this patient because you know what the rest of the doctors that we work with in our healthcare system are like. And I think there's a lot to learn from these attendings in that sense of how you can do a little bit more for all of your patients. Um, and then lastly, we have our speed demon uh, attendings, the ones who know all the patients already. They've already decided on the plan and disposition just as you put your name on the board. When you're working with these attendings, I like to treat it kind of as like a little race or a competition. Can you see the patient before the attending sees the patient? Can you at least try to talk to them, examine them and come up with a plan before you talk to the attending and then see if you guys agree, especially if you're taking a little bit more time um, than that attending who has to see that whole room, maybe you'll catch something that they won't. Um, so it's kind of nice to push yourself to be a little bit faster when you're working with attendings like these. Um, so I know we're running out of time, but no matter which way you're gonna go, which zone you're gonna choose for your evolution, which type of attending you think you want to be, I think we can all agree. The goal is to eventually be this. Those amazing attendings that can run a busy CCT room with their eyes closed, okay? So thank you to all of the attendings that have taught me everything over the past four years. Cheers to the best class ever. And you guys can always come visit me in San Diego.